that sin it brought an end to a perfect paradise that God had made. Blood was shed to pay my debt as the priest was sacrificed day after day. Would never satisfy the price of sin was just too high. We could have won, God's only Son could take it all away. But this man was wholly sinless, this man did not deserve it. This man gave it all to set me free. divine said hold it for all time and now he lives to intercede for me no one else could ever love me like he can none but this man Beneath the hill to Calvary with all mankind weighing on his mind he hung upon a cross for all to see the battle rage and darkness fell as the victor over death and hell for every sin for every man and died there on that tree but this man he reigns forever this man he changes never this man rose again in victory and this man with his blood divine said hold it for all time and now he lives to seed for me no one else could ever love me like he can none but this man he reigns forever this man he changes never this man rose again in victory and this man with his blood divine said hold it for and now he lives to intercede for me. No one else could ever love me like he can. No one else could ever love me like he can. None but this man. If you enjoy that, say amen. Wasn't that a blessing? Thank the Lord. Amen. Anything you sing about Jesus is always good. Hallelujah. Open your Bible up tonight to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. I'm interested in just a few verses tonight. Matthew chapter number 5. We're going to read just two verses. We're going to start in verse number 17. Kind of go backwards just for a moment if we could. And the Bible says this, Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 17. The Bible says, think not that I am come to destroy the law. This is Jesus who's preaching. Or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? To fulfill is what the Bible says. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. And you can stop there now. We are now at a place to where we're beginning a new section, if you want to say it that way, of the Sermon on the Mount. Just to go back, to be able to think and remind, if you can, for just a moment. Remember that we've talked about this being the greatest sermon that's ever been preached by the greatest preacher that's ever preached. 
We open up with the Beatitudes, and the Beatitudes, simply Jesus was teaching that Christ was come, and he has come literally to be able to rule and to reign. And whatever happened, that if they would allow him to be able to rule and reign, that God would be able to give them, as we know the Beatitudes, to be able to have a blessedness or perfect blessing, perfect happiness, if you want to say it that way. We went through every single one of them understanding how unusual it was it's amazing how God how he began to open up and when he opened up he says I have a desire for you to be blessed by the way I'm glad that I serve a savior that he's not trying to ruin our life he's not trying to make us miserable by the way being saved does not mean you have to be miserable listen it's the best life that you and I could ever have or ever want or possibly even more than we could ever ask for it's simply being saved so over and over and over Jesus said blessed he went through it blessed is the poor in spirit blessed are they that mourn blessed are the meek and even though that seemed to be unusual what God was saying is the world would say you can be happy by having vengeance that you can be happy by not being meek that you can be happy by not mourning but Jesus says no that's not the case if you really want happiness you need to be able to mourn over your sin you need to be meek you need to be merciful that's where true happiness is and here's why because you're revealing and you're living as if your trust is not in you but it is in the almighty hand of God so you trust the Lord in all things so he says that's when you're blessed when you're not moved by anything or anybody that you ever face this is the thought of blessedness now the key to that is this is we know it's possible And the reason it's possible is because Jesus never changes. Amen. He never changes. So we can be content at all times because we know, praise God, keep our eyes on him. If he said be merciful, then praise God, I'm going to be merciful. It might not seem right. It might not feel right. I might want to be able to do what I want to do. But as long as God said to be that way, I can trust him. Why? Because he is the Lord. The Bible says he cannot change. He will not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And by the way, he would told us very plainly the Lord himself he cannot lie so if God said blessedness is through these ways then praise God we ought to be able to believe him tonight but then he makes a transition and it comes to the verses that we read just the past few weeks the Bible says that he came to verse 13 he says now ye who are ye ye are listen to me those who choose the blessedness route Not the people to just choose to be able to live one or the other. No, when you completely submit yourself and all of those things that he said, that though you might not be perfect, but it is your heart's desire to be what? To mourn, to be a poor in spirit, to be able to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to be merciful, to be pure in heart. When it's your heart's desire, then he said, notice verse 13, then ye are the salt of the earth. Just because you're saved don't mean you're the salt of the earth. I mean, I hate to say that. It's those that know that not only is he enough to be able to get you to heaven, but he is king and king of, uh, king of kings and Lord, Lord of lords of your own heart. So many people are saved and they're on their way to heaven, but he's not king of their life, or at least they don't live that way. So God says, when you are in a place to where you make me king over everything, then guess what? You are the salt of the earth. So what that means is that we set the, uh, maybe I say this way, we set the flavor of the world, right? That, that people begin to see things. People's lives are changed because we are the salt of the world. And then he goes a little further in verse number 16. He says, let your light so shine before men they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He goes back. So now he's talking about ministering. He says, as you minister, and by the way, this is not the sermon or the message, but as you minister, whether you're a leader, whether you're a layman, whatever it is, you might feel like you're insignificant. We've already learned there is no such thing as being insignificant to serving God. But if you're saved by the grace of God, friend, as you minister, you should be as the salt of the earth and you should be the light of the world. You should be. Why? Because the light lives inside of you. And this world is a dark, dark, dark place. 
And if we would just live the way that God said live, in the midst of it all, it would open up their eyes because number one, they think people who are meek are unusual. So we're going to catch their attention. And then why does it happen? Not that they can see us. They're going to say, well, when they look at us, not that it may glorify us, but it may glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So they're going to look at you and say, wow, how can that person be so meek? How can be she, she be so merciful? How can they always uh, be so greed over their sin and not live like they're better than anybody else? I'll tell you how. Not because it's good of them, but because Jesus Christ changed their life. It glorifies the Lord. That's what he says. And then he comes to this place. And he comes to this place in verses number 17 and 18. And this starts probably the longest section of the Sermon on the Mount as far as my study, my understanding. Because literally the Lord begins to teach about a lot of things. And he talks about the law. And he talks about morals. And he talks about these things. The first 30 years of Jesus, literally when he lived his life, he lived his life and it seemed to be unnoticed. People did not see anything much about him. It was a private life. It was not exposed. They noticed that there was a lot of good things about him. They noticed that he was very respectful. They noticed that there was never anything that was out of the way about him but until he got to where he was 30 years old nothing began to change and really openly to them but when he got to be 30 years old and his ministry began they noticed things in him such as his meekness they noticed his lowliness they noticed the way that people was looking at him they noticed the way that he was a friend to sinners they noticed the way that he gave mercy they noticed the way that when he spoke and when he preached that it was different than anybody else they understood his message of repentance they knew there was something different about the Lord Jesus Christ and here's why because when he came he began to speak and he speak with authority but there was a problem here was the problem that everything that he was saying in their opinion and the Pharisees and the Sadducees it did not line up with the law in their opinion and listen they literally thought that Jesus was like a heretic in other words in what they believed that he was opposite of that now, let me kind of make it practical to you tonight. Number one, let me just state this for the record. Jesus was not a heretic. Amen. Okay. He was not. But the reason why this matters is because sometimes we read stories in the Bible, such as the woman that was caught in adultery. And what did they do? They came to Jesus and say, woman, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, literally in the act of adultery. And in other words, what they do is they almost question Jesus. They want to know what he's going to do as if they're going to catch him in a, in a, in a situation where he's going to contradict the law. That's what they always want to do. So there's this fine line that we're living in today because we live by grace. We got to understand what grace is. Grace, okay, though he came to fulfill the law, does not remove the law. Do you understand that? I mean, listen, the Ten Commandments are still the Ten Commandments. We are to be morally what we should be, but that's not based upon what the government says and your mom and dad says no live with the bible says and if we live with the bible says then we will please the lord but there's a fine balance and the fine balance is between grace and the law so when he comes here now he begins to open up and he explains he begins to explain that tonight hopefully this will help you as it helps me to be able to understand the difference or how the similarities may come together. Maybe that's a better way to put it. The similarities come together between Jesus Christ being the fulfillment of the law and the law itself. Because there is no such thing as a contradiction. So I give you three things tonight. First of all, talking about Christ and the law. The first thing I'd say is this. Is the fallacy concerning the Messiah. The fallacy concerning the Messiah. What do you mean by that? Well, the first thing is this. You have to understand that there were some lies that was given. They were trying to lie about him. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 17. He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law. Well, what was the lie? Well, the lie that everybody was saying is that Jesus literally was trying to disregard the law. That's what he was trying to do. They were lying about him. And I'm going to say this to you. There are going to be a lot of people that's going to lie about you and me when we're doing what God wants us to do too. But that's not what Jesus was doing. He was not trying to destroy the law at all. No, it makes it plain. He was coming to fulfill the law. Understanding the law, the law, there's three different sides of it. There's the ceremonial law, there's the judicial law, there's the moral law, known as the Ten Commandments. These are the things. So he 
God says, Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy that, but no, rather not, I came to be able to fulfill that. So what they were saying was that literally that by him coming, he was trying to try to destroy the authenticity of the law. In other words, that it was not legitimate. That's what they were trying to say. And friend, that's not the case. That's not what Jesus did. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Luke, chapter number 16, verse number 16. The Bible says this, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. So what Jesus says is literally, I came and when I came, I came and I was preaching and it might be different preaching than you, than you ever heard, but just because I'm preaching grace and mercy does not mean that I'm trying to remove the law. And Jesus said, it does not change the authenticity because I'm preaching grace and mercy. That's not what happened, no. He come to fulfill the law. So by that, God ties them together. And then because we live right before God, what will we do? We will fulfill the law. That's what he's saying. So when you live right before Jesus and you live for Jesus, you don't have to live by the law because when you live by right by Jesus, Jesus will help you what? Live out the law because that is our standard. Jesus is our standard and you must understand that. Now, I want to say this too. Just because he preached grace and mercy. And just because I'm guilty of preaching about grace and mercy a lot. And I preach on sin and stuff too. But a lot of times I am. I, I'm a smiler. I'm a nice guy. I'm not mean. I don't try to hurt people. I don't try to hit them over the head in Jesus' name. I, I leave that up to Brother Mark Beckman. Amen. I'm just kidding. No, I, I, I don't do that. That's not my spirit. It's not my nature. And a lot of that, I'm going to be transparent here, is because I still know, praise the Lord, who I was before I got saved. And I also know who I've been since I've been saved. And it waters me down, not on the scriptures, but it waters me down in this egotistical way. I, in other words, I'm not better than other people. But here's the key to it. Jesus said, just because I'm preaching grace and mercy, just like me as a preacher, any other preacher, that does not give us the right to sin and live the way we want to. You got you to you see that. You got to understand that. And that's what the Lord was saying. I might be preaching grace and mercy, but just because I'm preaching grace and mercy, you, you don't even know the rest of the story. That don't mean that I'm trying to change the law itself. No, the law is still in effect. I just came to fulfill it. But not only was it the authenticity, but also it was the authority. They said he's trying to destroy the authority. And friend, there was nothing that he was trying to do to, to substitute the law itself. There was nothing that Jesus done whatsoever to substitute the law. That's never his attention. It never was all through the Sermon on the Mount. Matter of fact, the more you read the Sermon on the Mount is the more that he said, I agree with the law. But what he said is the law's not just in what you read. The law is who you submit to because when you submit to me, you will fulfill the law. You will live right. So they called him a liar, but Jesus was not a liar. So the second thing it brings to is not only did he have to deal with the fallacy concerning his, the Messiah, but the second thing is this, is the facts concerning his mission. In other words, why did you come? Why is it? Well, notice what the Bible says in verse number 17. He says, think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets, but notice this, but I'm not come to destroy the law, but to what? But to fulfill. In other words, I've come to satisfy. Jesus says, I come to satisfy. Notice what he said there in verse 17. He said to destroy the law or the prophets. So in other words, when you go back and you begin to look at the, at the word of God, and you study all the commandments. What the Lord was saying is there are two different things, okay? The law and the prophets is not the same thing. It's two different things. What he's saying is, I come to fulfill the law. So everything that was stated to you and the commandments that were given to you, when you submit to me, you're going to find out that everything that you need in life is going to be what you need found in me to be able to live out the commandments that were given to you. That's what he says. So I came to fulfill the law. But then the prophets. What do you mean by the prophets? In other words, everything they said was true? No. The Bible says that the, the prophets, they spoke of Jesus. Isaiah said it specifically, that he said it would be one of a virgin. So in other words, he came to fulfill everything that they said that he would be is exactly what he was. 
Everything that said that he would be is exactly what it was. So Jesus, look at me for a minute. He says, I'm just letting you check it off. One by one by one. I'm checking off everything to be able to show and reveal to you that I am the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's what Jesus was saying. So he made it plain in every aspect, whether you look at it from what the prophet said or whether you look at it from, uh, from what the law said, it makes no difference. In every aspect, Jesus says, I am the King of Kings. Let me give you some scripture. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter number 13, verse number 8, listen to this. Romans 13, uh, chap, uh, chapter number 13, verse number 8. He says, Owe no man anything but love one another, for he that loveth another hath what? Fulfilled the law. So here Jesus come to be able to fulfill the law. Do you understand to fulfill the law? It literally, listen to me, it demanded perfection. It demanded, can I ask you something? If all you, all you and I were judged upon was the way that we love people, will we be found perfect? And let's, let's, not, let's not even talk about nothing else. Thou shalt not, thou shalt. If all it was is the way that you love people, would you be found perfect? And see, Jesus says, friend, everything about me, everything that you see in my life, everything that it should be, I am the perfection. That's why the Bible says literally, for he hath made him to be sent for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteous of God in him. That's why Jesus was able to be our substitute because he was the perfect sinless son of God. Amen. So he come to be able to fulfill the law. Let me give you another verse. Romans 8, 4. Listen to this verse. Romans 8, 4. The Bible says this. Romans 8, 4. The Bible says, um, let me get there, I'm sorry. The Bible says this. He says that the righteousness, talking about Jesus, okay, through Christ, through Christ, what? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So there it is again. This is what he's saying. He's saying, I'm not throwing the law out. I'm not throwing thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt I'm not throwing that out. What I'm saying is if you will live by the spirit, Listen to me, church. You might not know a chapter and you might not know a verse, but you can still live right and please God because the Holy Ghost lives inside of you and you follow the Spirit of God that lives inside of you. So that's why we say there is no such thing as, well, I didn't know. No, friend, if you're saved, you might say, I didn't know. You might not ever heard a, a message preached on it. You might not ever known, you know, that something was said about the Bible. But the Holy Ghost is not going to give you peace about doing something out of the will of God. Now, here's the question. Whether or not we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. That's really the question. Whether or not we're able to just tune it out and keep on going. You know, it's a silly illustration, but... Sometimes me and you can relate to silly illustrations. You ever looked at a kid, maybe your kid, and you wonder why in the world did you do that when you knew better than to do that? And all you can think about, they must have been desensitized. Desensitized, that's a good word. Desensitized, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Ghost gave me that word, desensitized, amen. You ever look at your children and say, they just turned me off right there and did what they wanted to do. You ever, or you ever looked at this and you know they know better. You know they know better, but they do it anyway. Right. You know what they're doing? They're just turning it off. That's the same way, unfortunately and sadly, that some Christians are with the Lord Jesus and the Holy Ghost. And they will argue with you because they know so much Bible. And if you really want to argue Bible, some of them, I've learned this. Now listen, I've been a young Christian for a long time and there's a lot of things I learned. They'll argue with you because they could talk circles around you, around you about the Bible. But they can, they can pick verses all they want to. But friend, at the end of the day, the Holy Ghost ain't going to lie. Right. You understand? Well, the Bible, what do you think about this? Friend, you don't have to confuse. Sometimes I'm confused reading the Bible. Amen. I'm going to be honest. But the Holy Ghost will make it plain. And the reason I'm telling you that is because you've got to come to a place in your life where you say, Lord, I, I'm not just going to live by what I know. I'm not going to live by just what I know. Lord, I want to be, I, I be led by the Spirit of God. Who walks not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Lord, I want to walk and live by the Spirit of God. And that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was making it very plain. That literally, that I come to fulfill the law. And when you live right by me, you will morally be what you should be before God. Amen. Now, here's the amazing thing about the law. Let me share this with you. The book of Galatians, chapter number 3, verses 24 and 25. Listen to this. It's amazing. So, why is this so important? Why is the law so important? 
Wherefore, verse 24, uh, Galatians 3, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So in other words, truth be told, if it wasn't for the law, you and I would have never understood and admitted we were lost. If it wasn't for the law. So thank God for the law. Thank God for the law because before the Holy Ghost, by the way, remember, you didn't come to Jesus. Jesus came to where you are. Amen. When you got saved, Jesus came to you. But it was the Word of God that revealed to you that you are not as perfect as you think you are. Right? The Word of God revealed to you and I that I am not the sinless person. I'm not A1. I'm not number one and everything. So thank God for the law. So there's a purpose for the law. But Jesus said, though you know the law, you get saved. Now you live by grace. Amen. Now you live by grace. So let me give you a third thing tonight. Not only do you see the fallacy concerning the Messiah, not only do you see the facts concerning his mission, and then lastly tonight, I give you this, the faithfulness of the manual. The faithfulness of the manual. I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 18, if you will, back in Matthew 5. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. This is what he's saying. He says the reason why you can trust the book, Jesus he says, the reason why you can know that I'm not here to discredit the law is because I'm the one that's advocating for the law. Did you see what he said? He says, verily, I say unto you. You know that word verily, what it means? It means truly. In other words, look at me. It's like when your mom and dad looked at you and said, because I said so. Right? Yeah, anybody ever heard that before? Because I said so? Well, that's what Jesus just said to them. Because I said so. The, the law is right because I said so. I'm telling you, I'm an advocate for the law. I'm preaching grace and mercy. I'm preaching all that. But the law is still the law, and I've just come to fulfill the law. So he teaches us that he is not contradicting the Bible. He's not contradicting the law, but rather he's fulfilling the law. So when you trust in Christ, what happens? is he then becomes to be your substitute and because of that you yield yourself to him you present your body a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service right by the renewing of your mind how by the law by the law but because you submit to him you'll be able to live by the law and God can bless you and use you but the problem is that's not the way we always live not only that but also this he says that I have come to be up verily I say unto you till heaven and earth shall pass Literally, he says that there's an author, and you can trust the author because it's God, amen. But then he says this, is that there's something there that affirms, there's an affirmation. Notice what he compares it to, till heaven and earth shall pass. He uses two things, and he says, listen, as long as it shall ever be, as long as it shall ever be, you can trust, you can trust that the word of God is settled forever. As long as it shall ever be, you can trust that the Word of God is settled forever. Why? Because literally, the Word of God is faithful and is true. Now, I say this in closing tonight. So where is the question? Or what's the question? What, what's, what's the confirmation, if you want to say it that way? Jesus is making plain that so many of you are messing up. And forgive me now, listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to discredit the Word of God. So many of you are living by what you know instead of who you know. Now, living in the New Testament, you can know all the Bible you want to and you'll die and go to hell. You understand? You must know Christ to be born again. So you can have all the knowledge, and this is what he's saying. This still remains. This is still intact, and it's still true. But because Jesus has come to fulfill the law, he has hung on the cross. He, he gave his life. He rose on the third day. He overcome hell, death, and the grave. Because of that, Jesus can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father by me. He can say that. And so what he's saying to us is this. Is I don't want you just to have an education. 
I want you to look unto me because if you look unto me, you will live right by this. But if you live right by this, to the best of your knowledge, you will still die and go to hell. That's why the Bible says, for he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, right? It's only through Christ and Christ alone that we must be saved. And not only is Christ what we need, must need for our salvation, listen to me, but it's also a must for our sanctification. So if we submit ourselves to the Lord, the things we used to say, it'll just get changed overnight. You know, little kids on the things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. No way. The things I used to say, right? The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Amen, right? We don't ever do it no more. But that don't happen overnight. It's called sanctification. How does it happen? Not because you get more knowledge, but because you yield to the Lord. And when you yield to the Lord, listen to me, you know what I learned? We want to learn more about the Bible. So the more that we, listen, the more that we love Jesus, the more that we live for Jesus, is the more that we want to be like Jesus. And you know how you learn to be like Jesus? You see him in the book. Amen? So let me ask you a question tonight. How is your balance? How is your balance when it comes to the law and Jesus Christ? You know, I, I say this, and I say it in, in, in the presence of our church. I wouldn't probably say this out preaching anywhere. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm okay with sinners coming as they are, but not leaving the way they came. You understand me? And this whole thing, just come as you are. Well, friend, yeah, when you're talking about a sinner, just come as you are. Problem is now we've deemed that as a, as a dress code. No, 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 no. And here's why. Because when they come in here, we know that when they get changed and God changes their life, then he'll, he'll not change them. He'll clean them up. He will change their, their presence. He'll change some things about them. And we use this a lot. But friend, it comes to your mouth. It comes to your actions. It comes to your attitude. Uh, listen, I, I, this, this is where it's going to get some of it. Your body language will change. Amen. I'm out telling you, friend. I, you know, <laughs> I, listen, my, my dad ain't, ain't the Holy Ghost. But when my dad was in the room, because I was in his presence and I wanted to please him, I sat up and I didn't talk when I was supposed to talk. To I, I, was, I was listening to every word, right? Because he had an impact on my life. It's the same way with Jesus. And, what, and I love my, my earthly father, but he ain't never done for me what my, my heavenly father's done. When I come to church, friend, I don't want to sit back and be a spectator. I want to be involved in the things of God. I want to come in here and I want to be engaged. Your body language changes. But how often, how often, and we do this especially with teens and with kids, that we criticize them, we, we, we critique them because what they're doing all the time is you look sloppy, you do this, you, instead of listening to me, you're dating the wrong guys, you're dating the wrong girls, you've got a poor choice of friends. You want to know why? Because we haven't taught them how to find their value in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the whole key to it. If we teach them to find their value in Christ, Christ will help them pick the right friends. Christ will help them to be able to pick the right words. Christ will help them to be able to dress and act the right way. God, Christ will help them to be able to do all those things. So the issue is not what they don't know. It's who's king of their life. And it ain't just kids, it's adults. He's not king anymore. He's been dethroned. He's been dethroned. So I get somebody to piano tonight. I know it's a unique invitation. But I don't know, maybe tonight you'd be just like me and studying and thinking and preparing. You have to stop and take a time out a couple times and say, Lord, thank you so much. If it was up to the law, listen, friend, I'd die and go to hell. I'm being honest with you. I'd die and go to hell. But as many preachers say and many singers say, he, he looked beyond my fault and he saw my need. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? He looked beyond that. He never gave up on us, not willing that any should perish. Why? That's the grace of God. That's the mercy of God. Amen. Now, that don't disregard the law. We need the book. Amen. We need the Bible. But I'm telling you something. We can know all we want to know right here. We can still fail and mess up all day. Matter of fact, if we know this and we're lost, not only will we die and go to hell, we would probably have a bitter, angry spirit. Why? Because we'd be so judgmental to people. All we have is an education. 
We don't need an education. We need that relationship with the Lord. Amen. So tonight, let's just be grateful for the mercy and the grace of God. We'll finish the next two verses, Lord willing, next week, because this talks about the same thing. And then we begin to dive into some very hard things. Listen, you think, you think the Lord's easy. This is what was so funny about this. We're, we're beginning to go into all the morals. You're going to realize he's going to teach you the law is nothing. <laughs> Jesus is going to say, now that I come, it's a lot deeper than that. I'm going to teach you how not even to lust. Right. Amen. You know, I mean, listen, you think the law is hard. Jesus says, friend, I didn't come to disqualify or destroy the law. It's, it's actually more difficult. But by the way, you can do it as long as you what? Submit to the Lord Jesus. You stand your feet tonight, heads bowed, eyes closed. Just a moment of prayer. Just a moment. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in. And I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, then I want you to know that the word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that will be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust Him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take Him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today, and maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much, and we are definitely going to be praying for you in this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved, and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way, and there's something heavy on your heart, again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much and may God bless you.